Metal Gear Solid 1 was released in 1998 by Konami for the PlayStation 1. I was born in the PS1 era, 1995, and played many video games from a young age. My oldest and dearest memory is playing Metal Gear Solid 1 growing up with my older brother, who was four years older than me. I, being about six, when we got our hands on the demo of MGS1, played the support role, mainly observing and experiencing the story from the sidelines. But the beauty of MGS1 is that it's the first game I can think of that deals with narrative and story in the same way that a blockbuster movie would, so this didn't affect my enjoyment of the game, not by a long shot. The footage on screen now is from E3 1997. If you weren't alive when this came out, you simply won't understand just how good this looked for the time. Aside from the graphics, MGS1 was about to do something never before seen in gaming, in terms of story, action, soundtrack and gameplay. We initially played the demo version of the game, containing only the tip of the iceberg of the game's story. We played this thing to death, 100 plus times I think. We were obsessed. We then eventually got our hands on a rental copy, which we would rent back to back every weekend until we eventually completed it. Renting this game presented some challenges that I'll get into later in the video, but this kind of personal experience definitely adds character to the way in which we used to enjoy games back in those days. Something that is traded for convenience and ease of access nowadays. This principle carries over to a lot of the way the game is made too. Less hand-holding and more figure it out for yourself was characteristic of the time. Nowadays we are handheld through games with step-by-step -step quest logs and arduous amounts of information forced down our throat in the heads-up displays. That said, some of the codec calls can over-explain in places where it doesn't need to, and don't occur when they may be needed. But I digress. I want to start out this video describing my personal experience with the game because I believe it's important to understand the context of my opinions that I'll present henceforth. Replaying this, I encountered minor and various difficulties in the controls and presentation that are just a sign of the times, but the kid inside me feels joy and nostalgia when they occur more than frustration and impatience. I cannot help but love this game and all the games in the series for that matter. I'm a massive Metal Gear fanboy. so. Let's get into it. In Metal Gear Solid 1, you play as Solid Snake. Without question, for me, the best video game protagonist of all time. I mean, just look at him. It's actually such an achievement to make something with four pixels look and come across as this fucking cool. Working with the restrictions on hardware that Kojima was back then, I mean, it's actually quite similar to reading a book. Your mind does the legwork with the information provided to fill in the gaps on what this guy actually looks like. That said, the codec calls provided a much more detailed picture of what Snake looks like, as well as other characters you speak to on this. Your brain then puts the two together for the rest of the scenes outside of the codec calls, a great touch by whoever was responsible for this idea, as it allows Kojima to build the connections required between the character and the player in order to tell this gripping and emotional narrative. As I previously mentioned, I've played and loved all of the Metal Gear games from a young age, so prepare your anus for incredible bias in favour of Mr. Snakey Pants. Solid Snake is at this stage in the story a former spy and legendary saboteur. Born of the Les Enfants Terribles project, the terrible children for those of you who don't speak French, this was a project that undertook gene therapy experiments to take traits from someone who is regarded as the greatest soldier to ever live, Big Boss. Snake prior to this game was a member of a revered special forces unit called Foxhound, itself being commanded by Big Boss during this time. Snake garnered his fame by repeatedly disarming and destroying the latest incarnation of the Metal Gear units from which this series takes its namesake. Metal Gear, to touch on it briefly, is usually a bipedal mechanical tank that draws heavily on Japanese influence in appearance and function, capable of mass destruction. Snake has encountered them in two previous MSX games, Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2. In this game, Snake is initially retired following these events, before being captured by an old colleague, Roy Campbell. And this is where we join in. Upon starting MGS1, we are met with an opening cutscene which gives us the context of the mission. This is a beautifully crafted and typically movie-like way to open a video game, something not done before in this medium. An ethereal soundtrack kicks in as we see a sub cruising through the Bering Sea in Alaska. We hear narration from Roy Campbell, the retired colonel in charge of this operation. Roy tells us that a nuclear weapons disposal facility on an island named Shadow Moses was taken over by terrorists, ex-members of Foxhound. 
Their terms are that the US turns over the remains of Big Boss within 24 hours, otherwise they will launch a nuke at an undisclosed location. The terrorists are also holding two hostages, DARPA chief Donald Anderson and president of private military company ArmsTech, Kenneth Baker. Our mission has two objectives, one of them to rescue said hostages, the other to investigate whether the terrorists have the means of launching a nuclear weapon, and if they do, to stop them. Snake is to enter the facility covertly through what is termed an SDV, swimmer delivery vehicle, to not trigger any radar or sonar equipment. We are told that all equipment for the mission is OSP, on-site procurement, and we're also given some exposition on the terrorists, that we, Snake, used to be a member of Foxhound, and that Roy Campbell also used to be a commander of Foxhound. Then, the members of the terrorist group are introduced. Now I think about this, and it's it's actually very Soulsy, isn't it? Like all the Souls games have introductions where they talk about the Lords of Cinder, for example, or the bosses in Elden Ring. The Lords of Dung Eater. Did Elden Ring copy Kojima? There's also like a similar quantity of. <laughs> <clears throat> sorry, sorry about that. The terrorist scum are as follows: Psychomantis, said to have psychic abilities. Ooh, Sniper Wolf, Woman, Decoy Octopus. Master of Disguise, Vulcan Raven, Big Boy Eskimo, Revolver Ocelot, Sharpshooter and Master of s &M. Last but not least, Liquid Snake, our brother and the leader of the operation. The opening cutscene stops there and when we initially played the game as young, innocent boys, we just got straight into it and hit the new game button faster than you can say shalashashkashka. If you scroll up to the option that says briefing, we can get some more context on the mission, the terrorists and our team. This is a really cool element of the game. I like that it balances the depth of the story through mandatory and optional cutscenes to allow the casual player to get straight into it. Or if you want more, go ahead. We've rendered 25 minutes worth of footage and dialogue to get your greedy little teeth into. Something my child brain never understood at the time was why Snake had blonde hair here and brown in the game. My dumbass thought they were interviewing Liquid and this was just another part of the story that I was too young, dumb and full of C4 to understand. It actually explains this at the end of the briefing sequence quite clearly though, that he cuts his hair to avoid being confused with the terrorist leader. In the briefing section we hear that Roy captured us unwillingly and then took all of our clothes off. And we see Naomi, the doctor of this operation, give us an injection of nanomachines. Nanomachine, this atomic cocktail of drugs and mini robots are an essential part of this story and the rest in the series. They suppress Snake's appetite, increase his focus, regulate his temperature, regulate his adrenaline and just generally back up all of the functions he needs to be the super soldier needed to do this all by himself. We do, however, have a team available on Zoom to support us remotely. This team consists of Roy, Naomi and Mei Ling to start with. Wait. Apparently there's someone called Natasha Romanenko. I've played this game so many times and never actually fully gone through this briefing. This is the first time my amphibian brain has noticed her name. And like most women in life, she won't call you and she's totally optional. Other people just complicate my life. During this briefing, Snake also asks Roy what his true motive for coming out of retirement to lead the operation is. He concedes to tell the truth, something that will happen numerous more times from here, that he has an ulterior motive. That motive is called Meryl. Roy's redhead niece is also being held hostage as she was stationed there when the revolt took place by the terrorists. In the text that displays on the screen, we see that she has had a ton of combat training as well as psychological training to resist advances of the opposite sex. But she is considered green as she's not had any actual experience of real combat. We also learn here about the genome army genetically modified soldiers that were used in US Black Ops. They've been designed to have the best genes available to be soldiers. Good hearing, as well as good vision. Snake believed the process of gene therapy for soldiers was outlawed, but Roy explains that this is carried out in secret even though it was declared illegal. We'll find more out about these fellas later in the story. This briefing is incredibly immersive. Kojima has done a ton of work on the science behind soldiers, nuclear weapons, military operations and the historical context in which he set his game. Playing this in 2024 as an adult adds so much more to the story I love. 
Not to mention the further detail provided on the terrorists and Liquid really helps to make you care about the characters and be informed just enough to understand what you're doing, rather than just running around going boom boom with a gun because video game, or attacking everything in the lands between just because it attacks you. A nice touch by Kojima in some of these scenes is that they've allowed you to move the camera, zoom it in and out. This really adds to the immersion that you're someone sat behind a screen observing and recording this briefing, as I imagine would be done in a military operation of this time. Kojima is known for his great attention to detail in this game and would go on to show this in further games. So, I selected easy for this playthrough. Easy because, unlike Souls games, the fun isn't in the challenge, it's sneaking, it's narrative, it's emotive. The challenge of this game is mostly with the controls anyway, so that still exists whatever option you choose. I think if you choose hard, the only difference is the radar being present. Because the enemy's vision is based on the cone shape in front of their location, hard just sounds like it might be more frustrating than rewarding, especially when this game has so many varying cone shapes depending on the type of enemy or if it's a surveillance camera. P.S. When I play Souls games, I like to play naked, alright, so you can't say I always take the easy road. Okay, now I've justified why I've chosen the bitch route, let's get into this. What was that sound? It's fucking gorgeous. We're quickly introduced to who we can deduce is Liquid. He's expecting us. We can then check in with Roy Boy to say we've managed to enter the facility as planned. Colonel, we've managed to avoid drowning. Good job. He then does lots of fourth wall breaky stuff that's blended in with the game lore. These fourth wall breaks never bothered me to be honest. I like the way that Kojima integrated them. Back in the 90s, games were games, and despite how immersive these games are, they never shy away from stuff like this. I personally like the way that they did it. This is because it avoids an out and out tutorial. The first stage we enter holds two genome soldiers and a rather basic setup of storage containers. It's a good way to ease you into the game's mechanics intuitively. I must have spent hours down here as a kid because it wasn't that scary and I knew the risks and enjoyed the environment. You can also find a couple of rations down here if you do get into a scrap with the guards. You have to wait for a third soldier to come down in the elevator before you can progress. If you hadn't figured this out for yourself, Roy will call you to mansplain this to you. As soon as the guard descends, we can just run straight up there, and the guard's genetically enhanced senses and hearing are quite literally numb to the industrial elevator ascending. Snake then uses this opportunity to strip down to his iconic sneaking suit, and we're hit with the main title card of the game. Hell yeah, I touched on it and we'll do it later in the video, but the OST done by Harry Gregson Williams never fucking misses. This level of quality was completely unheard of in video games. Another truly innovative choice to place so much importance in a Hollywood level score. We arrive at the top of the elevator to see where we will be entering the facility. Snake decides the first thing he wants to do is hit on both Naomi and Mei Ling. Mei Ling takes the opportunity to break the fourth wall again and shows us how to save our game, and also explains the radar system. Naomi lets us know that we can see her naked when we complete the mission and explains the highly developed senses of the genome soldiers that we've already confirmed is, uh, <clears throat> bullshit. Must have been the wind. Roy uses a diversion by sending two F-16s near the base. So Liquid fucks off to go start a fight with them, which gives us sufficient time to sneak in. By this point, there is 18 hours left until the nukes are launched. Game on. Roy also explains that there are two methods for getting into the building. Unfortunately, neither of them are just walking in the front door. And with that we're off. The helipad in front of you holds some chaff grenades. These are used to temporarily disable the surveillance cameras, which often guard more gear. They're really useful and plentiful, so I always take the opportunity to grab these and to not be shy to use them, as you'll find them everywhere. In the back of the truck, I recommend picking up the SOCOM handgun. Although it's not needed, it can get you out of some sticky situations if you're noticed by guards early on, before you get the FAMAS. It's really important later, as this is the only weapon that has a silencer too. So taking out guards later in the game is much easier as it doesn't alert any of the other guards. An innovative touch from Kojima for the time here is that the guards can be distracted by knocking and can also see your footprints in the snow. For this time, this kind of gameplay was utterly revolutionary. And still to this day, the AI in this game is better than some AAAs. We then get a call from Roy saying that Liquid has somehow shot down the F-16s using a hind. This is pretty impressive and it helps to build the character through indirect storytelling. 
These things often are consciously looked over when we're playing normally, but are so important for character development. When we get to the ducts, we're called by Liquid Snake. <coughs> Sorry, McDonald Miller. Snake refers to him as master and instantly trusts him, despite saying he would only listen to Roy in the briefing. He breaks this rule loads of times throughout the game. Miller helps us throughout the game and says we can call him if we have any questions on the flora or fauna we encounter, initially telling us to follow the rats. We come to an open grate in the vent duct where we overhear two soldiers talking about where the DARPA chief is held, and a woman hostage who we would come to know as Meryl. Anytime there is a woman, Snake either hits on them or just repeats the word woman inquisitively. After dropping down into the tank hangar, we get a quick call from Roy to explain again how the elevators work. Use the elevator to change floors. There should be a cargo elevator that you can take down somewhere around there. Try to find it. In case we forgot from earlier, we can find the thermal goggles in this area, as well as after getting the level 1 card, the SOCOM silencer. In my opinion, this is the most important item in the game. In this section, you'll have to use your expert sneaking skills here to avoid guards and security cameras to get into the elevators. Hmm. Expert sneaking skills. If these soldiers' sight and hearing was enhanced, then they must have been absolutely numb before because, from my experience so far, they're firmly sitting at well below average right now. Somehow, remarkably, we remember how to use the elevator and descend to floor B1, where we heard earlier they were holding the Derpa chief. Once again, we become Liberat and get into the vent shafts to go and break into his cell. We're treated to a nice cutscene of the guard taking a dump next to some maggots. Cut a damn cold. I hate Alaska. Boy, oh boy, that woman is built up. A cutscene of Meryl doing sit-ups, which Snake once again just says, and finally, just as we're obviously about to drop down into Chief Wizard's room, Roy calls us to tell us to do exactly what we were about to do. As a six-year-old, I could really relate to this. My mum would always tell me to brush my teeth every morning. Even if I had my toothbrush in my hand, she'd tell me to do it. My mum equals Roy Campbell, confirmed. Once we get to the ventilation gate, we drop down to make contact with part one of our mission's objective. Donald is rightly perplexed when we say we're here to save him after entering the cell in quite an unhinged fashion. D-Dog confirms to us that the terrorists do have the ability to launch a nuke. Is it possible? It's possible. And that he was there to conduct tests as suspected on a nuclear equipped walking battle tank. Snake immediately recognizes this as Metal Gear. Although these projects were meant to be banned, Drake here confirms that they are still taking place behind closed doors with the support of arms tech. He then confirms Metal Gear Rex has fallen into the hands of terrorists. <laughs> Donald shoes away the guard because he was being quite rude before going on to tell us that there are two passwords to launch the nuclear device. One that he knows and one that the second hostage, Kenneth, What's this Remarkable. knows. He says he gave up his password to Psycho Mantis, who we heard about earlier in the briefing, due to his psychic powers. Ooh. <laughs> he also tells us that we can stop the launch with an emergency system override using three PAL keys. All the while, Meryl is next door listening. He believes Keno has the keys and tells us how to get to him. Apparently he's behind concreted walls for some reason on B2. But best to just suspend disbelief here. He then shared the level 1 security card door with me, so we can go back to the tank hangar and get some more equipment, including the silencer. Snake then says, Bard. Before Donald has the first of many heart attacks. Roy then calls to tell us that he lied and doesn't know everything about the operation. <sighs> then, after hearing some ruckus, the guard opens the door for us. Only, it's not the guard. It's Meryl. A cool detail here is that if you look closely outside the door, you can see her waiting to pounce you. Meryl thinks we killed the chief, and we're just a bit like, yeah, I know what it looks like. Then Snake starts gaslighting the fuck out of Meryl like a true Sigma. This is cut short, however, by the Genome Boys breaking through the door and attacking. Meryl initially can't shoot. As we touched on earlier, she's very green. So it's up to us to murderize the three men that maybe have families. We don't know. Snake, being the stone-cold Steve Austin killing machine that he is, has no issues doing this, and has no issues peer pressuring Meryl to do the same. We can see Meryl's hands shaking throughout this scene, which again adds to my immersion. I fucking love it when Kojima adds to my immersion man with his sexy little details. Hell yeah. She then goes full goblin mode and murders three at once. A hat trick. 
and she helps us to dispatch the rest before saying thank you very much and running off like this. We're then treated to a vision of sorts where we see Psycho Mantis, Liquid and Ocelot around the DARPA Chief. The DARPA Chief is on a torture bed that we would later become acquainted with ourselves. They seem to have accidentally killed the real DARPA Chief in search of the detonation code. So who was the guy we just spoke to? It couldn't be Decoy Octopus, could it? But then that also leaves us with more questions like why did he die and why is he helping us? We cut back to the action and Meryl suddenly has no problem with open firing on Snake as she escapes into the elevator. She then hits us with a Fortnite emote as the door slams shut. We then see Psycho Mantis in front of the elevator. Now I'm not super smart or 180 IQ or anything, but I assume this means that she was under some mind control effect to shoot at Snake. Snake, however, thinks this is hallucination, despite literally having an IQ of 180, and calls Naomi to tell her. After this, we still have one more floor to visit in the elevator. As Decoy Octopus told us, we're looking for some different coloured walls down here. B2 essentially is a big storage area with lockups for equipment. Some of these doors you can open with a level 1 card, but most are 2 and above. This suggests that we will most likely have to come back later once we progress to that level of the card. So we now understand that this game is not completely linear. Again, for 1998 this was pretty innovative. Not necessarily good or fun in practice, but different to what's been done before, and to become a typical trait of Kojima's work. When you do end up backtracking, I do like the way that Kojima doesn't make it much harder, but just changes the challenge up a bit. It freshens it up. For example, on the snowfield, they add mines and cameras. It breaks up a clean and boring job and lets you resupply on claymores if needed. In B2, some floor tiles collapse as you run over them. I don't know what's under this floor, but apparently it's just the great void, as we instantly get a game over if we fall down them. They're quite easy to avoid by running around them or just running straight over them. Snake is quick enough. They should only really catch you if you're fighting guards or unfortunate enough to stop on them. We already know we're looking for some discoloured balls here, but Kojima actually puts a number of them around the edges of B2. Some don't lead to our objective, but they do reward us with resupplies and equipment. These kinds of secrets again are typical Kojima, and I love it as I love anything that rewards exploration. This is something that will go on to inspire countless open world games and deserves highlighting. It's cool that you can use the thermal goggles to see the loose floor tiles, and in some rooms allows you to see the lasers that set off the alarms when you touch them. We come across the walls Decoy spoke of. Using C4 to destroy these, we eventually come to the first boss of the game, Revolver Ocelot. We enter the room to find a big fat, fatty man strapped up to a structural column, with many wires around him. We approach him wondering if it's too late. The man lets out a grunt to confirm he is in fact still alive. Snake establishes that this is the arms tech president Kenneth Baker, who we discussed with the octopus man earlier. Snake tells him not to worry, that he's here to save him. As Snake approaches, Kenneth warns him that he's rigged up to C4 and not to touch the wires. We hear a gun cock and instinctively panic roll out of the way of danger, which we're treated to a cool slow-mo of. We then hear a voice. A gun appears from behind another column, closely followed by an old man. This is Revolver. Revolver Ocelot Ocelot. Revolver Ocelot. We should have guessed by all of the wires and the man tied up. Ocelot then does this. He says he's been waiting for us and wants to know if we will live up to the legend that precedes us. Ocelot then explains how a gun works and challenges us to a duel. Before I even talk about the fight, the fucking music man. Oh my god, this made me feel all types of important as a kid. The hero on the hero's journey killing the bad guys. It's a chef's kiss. Mwah. Show me another video game score that can match this from this era, coupled with the dialogue and the gameplay as well as a heavy dose of nostalgia, and I'm transported right back to that kid, sat on the floor in front of the TV because the controllers wouldn't reach our sofa, with my legs crossed and my heart racing. We quickly then see why he's called Revolver Ocelot, as he revolves around the room constantly running away from you. He's definitely into some danger kink too, as he likes to announce when he's run out of ammo. I love to reload during a battle. <laughs> during this battle, you need to avoid the wires in the middle of the room, whilst quickly trying to get some shots off at Ocelot, before he once again runs around the next corner. If you're creepy sick at games, you can sometimes shoot him in the middle of the room as he's moving to the next corner, 
but you do risk shooting the fat man, to which he'll likely respond, <laughs> Best to keep moving in this one, as Ocelot has bouncy bullets. If you stand still, he will bounce them off the walls and finish you off easily. After we finish playing merry-go-round, we're treated to this cutscene. You're pretty good. Just what I'd expect from the man with the same code as the boss. It's been a long time since I had such a good fight. But I'm just getting warmed up. What? My hand! Stealth camouflage. Can't you even die right? You were lucky. We'll meet again! The direction and the voice acting is really top notch, and Metal Gear would become famous for its cinematics going forward. This is also our first encounter with the ninja, who as you can imagine, as a kid, I was obsessed with. The character design for every single character in the game is so iconic, and I love Snake, don't get me wrong, but little me really really wanted to play as the ninja somehow, which is a testament to the quality and attraction of the characters Kojima has created. Here we get some exposition from our man Kenneth, which Long story short, tells us how they lost a bid to build fighter jets for the US government, and with a reduced forecast in government defence spending, spelled risk to his private military outfit. He went on to bribe the DARPA chief to support the development of Metal Gear Rex, which gives us the context of why they're both here. They were here to see the railgun test when the terrorists attacked and took over the facility. Baker tells us that he gave over his password to Ocelot due to the s and bondage torture he was subjected to and ended up giving his pal key to Merrill. He attempts to warn us of the Pentagon's true plans and objective for the mission before he is also subject to another heart attack. During this cutscene, we're also told to look on the back of the CD case to find Merrill's number. This is probably the thing that most of you who played the game back then remember most clearly. Everyone had their own ordeal with this, and ours went like this. We completely, as kids, did not understand that he meant the back of the actual CD case of the actual game as most others did also. We spent hours upon hours confused, backtracking and searching for a CD case in the game before realising that they meant the actual CD case. Great. Problem solved, right? Nay. Remember I said we rented the game? We always got it in a blank disc case, so we literally had no way of getting it. I remember talking shyly with the other kids at school, but no one else had played it, slash played PlayStation at all. Then my brother decided to brute force it, as many others did. We dialed blank numbers over 100 times before eventually finding her frequency. Before we go on, another really cool detail with this is that when you receive the optical disc containing Metal Gear test data in that same cutscene, if you equip it and hold it for some time, or just equip it and unequip it loads of times, Merrill's frequency will appear in the contact list in the drop down section of your codec. This is really cool as it gives two meanings to the phrase, it's on the back of the CD case, which myself and my brother at the time didn't manage to pick up on either of them. Side note, this is how we came across Natasha Romanenko, who I have no footage of as I completely forgot about her in this playthrough, as I do every playthrough. During this cutscene we're also given the level 2 key card so we can get the FAMAS in the armoury, an iconic weapon that even ended up making an appearance in COD Modern Warfare 2. I actually maimed this gun in that game because of this game, which again just shows how influenced I was many years later still. We also go back to B1 to pick up the SOCOM silencer before calling Meryl. When we call Meryl, they have a little bit of a back and forth before Meryl realises that she's talking to the Solid Snake and whips off her mask straight away. Snake immediately starts hitting on her because he is Snake and Meryl, well, she definitely likes it. This is the start of Snake's romance arc in the game. Meryl talks about her desire to be a proper soldier and it seems like all she wants in life is to be that. The music shifts to an ethereal and dreamlike track 
that becomes synonymous later in the game with deep and emotional moments, quite clearly telling us the tone has shifted and revealing a variety of tones that this story is capable of telling in such a compelling way. Snake is supportive but also authoritative and tells her what she needs to do to stay alive, somehow being both charming and a dick. They share a little laugh and Meryl promises to be a good girl. She agrees to open up the cargo door so we can progress. When it opens, we are met with lasers that if we touch them will release poison gas into the room. This is another boss battle with the controls here, but I am no noob and expertly navigated through the variety of speeds in which the lasers go uppy and go downy before exiting the first part of the facility into the snowfield. This is where we get a call from Deep Throat and he tells us that there's a tank about to ambush us and there's claymore mines laid ahead as traps. We equip the mine detector we picked up earlier, which reveals them on the map, and we slowly make our way ahead, crawling over the mines to pick them up. We then enter a cutscene. This is Raven's territory. Because I'm a stud. I'm ballsy. I don't take no shit from anyone. I smoke my stogie anywhere I want. I don't have to find a hideout place like you. <laughs> Send him a message. <laughs> That's right, you belong on the ground. You should crawl on the ground like the snake you are. Go, let's fight! We meet Raven, and he has some quite frankly terrible chat. You can see immediately I'm a pro at this, as I waste no time in chaff grenading the tank, disabling the main gun. This allows me to get close and use the grenades we got in the armory to Kobe them straight into the gunner's hole. The secondary attack from the tank is a machine gun. This still works when the other one doesn't, so you have to strafe to avoid it. You can also be run over by the tank, which leaves you down for a longer time than usual, so you want to stay to the right of the tank. Again, as a young kid with no prior experience of this boss fight, it is much harder, constantly getting blown up by the big gun before realising how OP chaff grenades were throughout the whole game. We tried to set claymores and hide behind the mounds at the entrance to the snowfield, and obviously just tried and failed shooting it with every gun we had. You kind of had to go against your instincts with this one. You really don't want to be anywhere near a tank, you would think. But getting through that mid-range is key to winning. As up close, it's heavy, it's slow, and it's more vulnerable. So it's a good boss battle, as like most others in this game, it really makes you think. We're then treated to some more expert chat from Raven, and he calls Liquid to tell him that we're progressing. Which doesn't seem to worry Liquid. It seems like they're letting us progress through. Hmm. Anyway, Raven is not dead, just like Ocelot, so I assume this is not the last time we'll be seeing them. Every time you beat a boss, your life increases and you can carry some more rations. This helps us live out the power fantasy the more we progress. We enter an area where sneaking is completely mandatory. This is a nuclear warhead storage hangar. If a bullet hits the warheads, then we are finito, as is everyone else in the blast radius. So, Naomi has used our nano machines to disable our guns. This area is good for some resupplies and some fun sneaking gameplay, but mostly just a corridor to progress through to the next area. We've demonstrated we can use an elevator competently now, so we don't receive a call from Roy to tell us how to do this. A proud moment. We go down to B1, which is very swanky. There are three rooms initially here, one male and one female bathroom and an office. We make our way into the male bathroom to deal with the first guard, Pretty unfairly, to be honest. My emulator was having a major malfunction trying to replicate this guy pissing, it almost looked like the whole body was censored, so I broke his neck. In the office, I check the guard's ass for reasons I'll come to shortly, and pick up some Nikita rockets for reasons I'll come on to even shortly era. We go down to B2 and we're met with a puzzle of sorts. There's a room filled with gas and armed surveillance cameras, as well as an electrified floor. We get a call from Deep Throat who tells us we need to use remote guided missiles to blow up the high voltage switch we were just shown. We have to go through the door to fire the Nikita and gently guide it towards the switch whilst monitoring our oxygen levels. On the way, armed cameras will try to shoot the missile, meaning you need to take these out first. Eventually, we hit the voltage switch and disable the electric floor, along with destroying the cameras, 
This just leaves the gas as the main threat in this area. We can find a gas mask in one of the rooms, as well as resupplying. We then enter a small room with no gas this time, a nice change, and hear some generalised pain sounds coming from further along. In another small room, we open a door to see probably the most brutal and scary scene I'd laid eyes on as a kid. like they were cut by some type of blade. If you look on the floor, you can see that one of them is still alive, reaching for air with deep breaths. Another great example of attention to detail, going the extra mile to get you immersed. This hallway does horror better than most new horror games. We then go into the next room to see this. The ninja is cornering a scientist who we would later know to be Otacon. When he turns round, we find out his main aim is to have a good, clean fight with us. Why would he want this? We must have a history with him, but Snake is clueless at this time. Otacon says, It's like one of my Japanese animes. And then we do battle with him. What's up guys, my name is the Below Average Gamer, aka Bag, aka Otaku Convention, and this is a Metal Gear Solid 1 boss guide. I won't be using any magic or parry during this tutorial, as usual. Today we'll be fighting the Cyborg Ninja. He has three phases. First thing to know is that bullets don't work, so put your FAMAS down and holster your SOCOM because we're going to have to go hand to hand here. You want to use the environment here to your advantage by positioning yourself on the corners of the office walls in the middle. When he gets to a corner you're going to want to do a 1-2-3 combo and create some distance to get away and repeat. In his second phase he's going to try and play hide and seek with you, which is fine. You can either use the thermal goggles to reveal his location and continue to feed him the combo when you get there, or you can look for his shadow on the floor. In his third phase, he's going to try using magic to dodge our attacks. Now you want to bait this. Then when he appears behind you, you're going to want to wait for his attack. Once he's committed, you're going to want to go in and give him the business. Worth noting that he has this attack I like to call monologuing. When he's doing this, he has iframes and your attacks won't actually land at all. Rinse and repeat until he enters phase 3.5, where he just becomes a little bit volatile. Best to whip out your Glock and just tap him once from distance to finish him off. And just like that, we've mastered the moveset of the Cyborg Ninja. If you like this video, please like, leave a comment and subscribe. We then get a call from Naomi and Roy. Snake says the ninja is Grey Fox, a character from the prequels that Snake was with in Zanzibar. Snake has a really strong relationship with Grey Fox, citing him as one of the only people he can call a friend in this game. We learn that his body was recovered from Zanzibar, and he went through brutal and inhumane experimentation by the US government as part of the genome soldier research. They were trying to identify the soldier genes, and they used him as one of the test subjects. This majorly affected him, turning him a bit loopy, as we just saw. It seems from the dialogue and learning this, that he just wants to die due to the pain he's going through, through battle with us. Naomi seems concerned about this, which is another story thread that will continue to the end of the game. On a lighter note, we meet Otacon, or Hal Emmerich. Hal would go on to be a key companion in this game to Snake for the rest of Snake's life as we see in the sequels. Two opposites, Hal is a proper nerd that wets himself immediately when we see him before the fight. This little piss weasel, probably smelling like piss, gives us some exposition in his role here. Just as my desktop well, widget decides to ruin my fucking recording. He and his family for that matter have all been scientists and have all worked on these weapons in the past. Hal seems to actually be under the impression that Rex wasn't going to be used to launch a nuke. You can tell he's genuine when he tells us this, however, Snake doesn't trust him to start with and accuses him of lying, and picks him up by the collar like a school bully would. Snake then shares with Hal how he's played the Oppenheimer role in developing Rex, and you can see Hal, despite how smart he's meant to be, never thought of the real world consequences of the weapons he has built, despite his grandfather being part of the Manhattan Project itself. <coughs> it's been staring them in the face for three generations, and he has this moment with us now that he realises his efforts were actually to the detriment of mankind. He then starts crying like a baby. 
He tells us we need to hurry the fuck up and either override the launch or destroy Rex. Snake says, you're not coming with me because you're slow and you smell like piss. So just lay low and support me on codec, okay pal? Thanks. Hal has the same camouflage we saw on Grey Fox, so he should be fine staying undetected. We then have a quick call with Meryl as she's spotted by the guards and we're cut off. Hal then says he noticed Meryl's ass and Snake shames him for even looking, though he did the same thing twice and we'll do it again shortly. Hal then insinuates that we need to get her where she's alone, in the woman's bathroom, so we'll go back to B1 to do just that. Before leaving, Snake has anxiety that Hal is going to have a heart attack like everyone he has met so far. Hal thinks this is weird. Hal then confirms his revelation that he's no longer going to be taking part in developing this weapon and wants to take responsibility for his part by stopping Rex. Snake doesn't give a fuck about this and Hal runs away crying. <laughs> we can see some cool little easter eggs in here. A Police Nauts poster and a Zone of Enders poster, both Kojima projects in the past, as well as a PS1 on the side a cool nod to the system that we were playing this on. MGS1 is seeping with these little details and I just wanted to point these out before we progress. We head back through the gauntlet to B2 using our level 4 card to resupply in the gas corridor on the way. We can get the night vision goggles here, which will be useful later. Back in B1, we once again murder a helpless guard whilst they are pissing. In the office, Meryl is hiding as a guard. You can either find this out by killing her and getting a game over, looking at all the guard's asses, waiting until she goes to the bathroom, or getting spotted by her. I love this game's attention to detail and not so much choices on how to play, but different ways to progress. Meryl runs to the female bathroom. I noticed that this game even has functioning mirrors, something games actually release without until this day. I still find some stuff out about this game today that I didn't know. It almost crosses into the immersive sim territory as you're mostly rewarded by using your brain to figure out different ways to do things. Meryl has set up a trap in the last stool which we need to trigger to progress. Snake then tries to hit on Meryl, and we find out how much of a fangirl Meryl is for Snake. Snake says he's no hero, but just a killer, destroying Meryl's long-held views. Meryl shares the power card given to her by Baker. Snake was expecting three of these, something we'll have to figure out later. Meryl then promises that if she can come with us, she won't slow us down, which, um, yeah, I guess we'll just have to see about that. Some of the dialogue in this scene is so full of campy one-liners and I'm totally here for it. Once again, we get hit with that song. Meryl looks into the mirror and contemplates her femininity. In the mirror. I've always despised that kind of woman. I always dreamed of becoming a soldier, but I was wrong. It wasn't really my dream. My father, he was killed in action when I was younger. You wanted to follow in your father's footsteps? Not really. I thought that if I became a soldier, I could understand him better. So are you a soldier yet? I thought I was until today, but now I understand. The truth is, I was just afraid of looking at myself, afraid of having to make my own decisions in life. But I'm not gonna lie to myself anymore. It's time I took a long, hard look at myself. I wanna know who I am, what I'm capable of. I wanna know why I've lived the way I've lived until now. I want to know. Take a good look. You won't get another chance for a while. You should wash your face, too, while you're at it. Yeah. This isn't a training exercise. Our lives are riding on this. There are no heroes or heroines. If you lose, you're worm food. Yeah. Is that famous functional? All I'm going to say about this is... Bravo, Kojima. When we exit the bathroom, the guards are gone and the music is cut. It's eerily quiet. Something is up. I took this opportunity to just stare at Meryl. If you do this for long enough, it'll make her quite upset and shy. She'll ask you what you're looking at, and I think she might even go a little red. Another little detail I just wanted to call out. I took this opportunity to punch her in the face. Interestingly, in line with her bullish character, she'll slap the shit out of you and scold you in retaliation, rather than just taking it. After messing around, we moved on towards the commander's room. Meryl then has a migraine and tries to warn Snake not to go any further. We see some ghostly vision of something going into Meryl's head and she starts talking a little weird, as if through a gas mask. And she calls Snake Mr. Foxhound. If we try to look through first person view here, we'll see the camera is from Meryl's perspective and is green, just like we saw a minute ago in the cutscene. It doesn't take a 180 IQ to suggest that this is Psycho Mantis possessing Meryl and this is confirmed in the next room.
Meryl then points the gun at us, trying to creepily seduce us. Snake, however, is too cool for girls, and is repulsed by this. Then we see Psycho Mantis behind Meryl, absolutely dunking on Snake by saying, You don't like girls? We get a call to confirm Meryl is not herself. Naomi says the music is his mind control music. We're instructed not to shoot Meryl, and to just beat her up instead. This was quite good, as we had practiced punching her in the previous room. Once she's knocked out, Psycho Mantis reveals himself. Optic camouflage, huh? I hope that's not your only trick. You... You doubt my power! Psycho Mantis could have a whole section on his easter eggs and mechanics, but I'll just highlight a few cool bits for the purpose of this video. In the following section, when I was young, and he vibrated my controller, I was so fucking scared and intimidated man, it's such a clever touch. It even worked on the DualShock 4 I was using on the emulator to record this gameplay. He's also famous for trying to read your memory card, quoting other games you've played, how often you've saved in this game, and whether you're sneaky or aggressive, whether you often get caught by traps, etc etc. I'm pretty sure the only game of this time that does stuff like this was Silent Hill 2, also released by Konami a few years later. I'm going to use that word again, innovative, because that's what it is. It's the little details like this that differentiate it from other games of the time, and why I was totally obsessed as a kid. In this fight, to stop him reading your mind you need to use controller slot 2. If you can't do this he will dodge 90% of your attacks, and the fight will become very hard. Along with also having the stealth camouflage, initially this becomes almost impossible. So, I decided to try it this way to earn some respect back from you guys for choosing easy mode. It's actually quite soulsy. You just remember his attack patterns and how to dodge them, then it's just a matter of executing it. I also didn't use my gun here to add to the difficulty. I crawled under his spinning chair attacks, getting up to get some hits off in the middle when they go out wider, and crawling for his other attack, using what I think are urns to throw at you. When he goes to the left side of the room, you know the paintings are going to come off the walls. Either get close to him so they don't hit you, or if you're in the middle of the room, you'll need to duck again. And when he goes invisible, and throws invisible tires, I think, at you, then you'll just need to strafe out the way of this, or get close to him to attack before he does. I noticed from the hallway, if we went into first person, we could see where he's positioning himself to get close to him as well. I love the options you have in this fight, and I really enjoyed playing it differently this time. As well as this, when he makes your screen turn black and it says Hideo in the top right, I love this. As a kid, we all thought our game broke and it's just such a great touch, man. If you don't use your second controller port, to make this fight easier, you can destroy the statues with the bandages around their eyes, and this will have the same effect. All the methods are viable, it's so great. Halfway through, Meryl will get back up and try to shoot you, this time with Mantis also attacking which is a nice bit of added challenge. Then she will try to blow her own brains out, and you'll have to stop her again. When we hit the final blow, we see Mantis ragdoll across the room which I thought was really funny. We get a quick call from Roy and Naomi to discuss why I saved Meryl, seeing as though we are perceived to be a heartless killer. This is where Snake's story arc starts to progress from cold blooded killer to having feels. It's one dynamic of his hero's journey. Now the following cutscene could be a little better if they changed the dialogue a bit from Mantis to reflect that I didn't use the other controller port, and that I beat him fair and square even though he could read my mind. Would have been a nice touch. In the Ocelot fight, I think the dialogue changes depending on if you beat him in under 5 tries or not. This would have been good to see that done here. Maybe they thought it was so insane for someone to try and beat him like this that they didn't bother, but just a small critique I guess. After this cutscene, Meryl reflects on what was said and her weakness in that whole situation. She beats herself up about it and, most likely in response to the comments about Snake being in her heart, is pretty downtrodden. As we know, she was trained not to be attracted to the opposite sex, so most likely she sees herself as a failure here. As Psychomantis said, Snake's in her heart in a large way. So then she can't help but ask, probably looking for some support from Snake, who she looks up to as the ideal soldier, if he has feelings like that to validate her own, to which Snake, pretty brutally, shoots her down. He has no place for this stuff, and neither should she if she wants to be like him. This has always felt like the midway point in the game for me, in terms of character development and their individual arcs, we are certainly well on the way. I decided to demonstrate Snake's growth in attitude to other people by punching Meryl in the face. As I lie on the floor contemplating my actions for, 
quite a while, I then decided to push on. We step outside to hear howling. Snake uses his mushing knowledge to tell us that they are half dog, half huskies. Meryl then speeds on without us. We can resupply here quickly and see through a gap in the rocks that Meryl got through really easily. Perfect. Should be quite easy for us too then, right? You can use the night vision goggles here to make it a little easier to see and grab some supplies. I chose not to beat up the wolves because uh, I'm not a monster, and you should too. On the other side, we see Meryl has a calming effect on the wolves. She berates us quickly for being bad with dogs, and we get to have this really cute little moment with the dogs as they emote the love heart before I accidentally end up staring at Meryl's giant pixelated bazungas again. Alas, we press on. What? What is it? Meryl says she can see the mines due to sharing mind cocktails with Psycho Mantis. She carves out a safe path for us to follow to avoid the mines. This is really useful, as we'd have no other way of getting through here safely without... in the book. The sniper's using me for bait to lure you out. Damn. Shoot me, Snake. No. My gun. I can't reach it by myself. Don't move. I promised. I wouldn't slow you down. I... I... I, I can still help. I want to help you. Quiet down. Save your strength. I was a fool. I wanted to be a soldier. But war is ugly. There's nothing glamorous about it. Snake, please save yourself. Go on living and don't give up on people. Don't forget me. Get out of here! Now, six-year-old me is about to fucking cry as the music cuts in. Is Meryl, the Bond girl, my sexual awakening, pixelated goddess, about to die here? Please, no. She lies there bleeding out, repenting on her desires to be a soldier. She's also beaten down. She is so beaten down and feels so stupid for wanting this that she tells Snake to let her die. Old Snake would most likely just let her die, but we're seeing him develop into a caring individual. We know at this point, our mission is to save her. Naomi tells us this is the work of Sniper Wolf, and that she won't let go until you fight her. She will wait as long as it takes. Snake confirms to Roy that he will save Meryl. This surprises Naomi again that he's opted to do this. Six-year-old me and 28-year-old me is so fucking pumped when Snake says this. I don't know what the hell my genes look like and I don't care. I operate on instinct. Like an animal? I'm going to save Meryl. I don't need an excuse. Okay. The boss music kicks in, but we can't fight her now. We need to do some backtracking. This is where a lot of the backtracking starts. We need to head back to B2 Armory to get the sniper, and we need to also get some diazepam to steady our nerves. We can find the diazepam in the office on B1, and also in a super sneaky little hole where the wolves are. I didn't mind backtracking here as I previously mentioned, there are different challenges on the snowfield and more guards in B2 to freshen it up. If we want, we can also search a number of doors we can access earlier using our higher level access card. However, it's not peak MGS1 gameplay, more padding for time, but me and my nostalgia are a-okay with it to be honest. The backtracking I have a problem with comes later in the game. Once we finish collecting all the items we needed, we make our way back to Sniper Wolf. 
We notice Meryl's body is no longer there, only a blood stain, leaving us to wonder if she's died or if she was removed and what captured. It really isn't clear at this time, which puts our romantic story arc with her either to bed or on hold. Sniper Wolf sits at the other end of this passageway on the balcony of the communications tower we were trying to reach. I found this fight a little more difficult than previous, as you were once again contending with the controls. It didn't feel like I'd mastered a strategy when I beat her, more so just brute forced it. I would just run out into the middle, drop down onto my tum tum and hope she didn't hit me. When she hits you, you're forced out of the ADS and knocked back sometimes. This happened to me a couple of times. When I finally got my sights on her, I would often miss due to clunky controls. No, not because I'm a bad gamer, because of the controls. It feels like she always has her scope on you, so I tried a lot of waiting before jumping out and trying to bait her attacks. When she finally shot, I got down and landed my first shot, then another. Just as I thought I had her, she's capable of landing multiple shots in quick succession. I then emptied my whole damn clip and missed her. This angered me so much that I became more bullish in my strategy. That also didn't work, and she hard scoped me a couple more times. I was running out of rations and losing my battle with the controls. As Hope looked lost, I landed two absolutely bad boy headshots and the music cut abruptly to the sound of wind whistling through the passage. No cutscene or anything. I stood over the spot where we lost Meryl and took in the ominous atmosphere that this game so expertly created. Then I pressed on. As if the ominous atmosphere wasn't enough, Mei Ling calls us to tell us this. Snake, wouldn't now be a good time to save your mission? Great, now I'm very scared. Obviously in hindsight I know what's happening here, but as a kid I was so scared man, and when that alarm sound kicks in as you're captured, I almost turned inside out. We then see this cutscene. It's hard to miss when you're this close. Toss your weapon over here. Slowly. You are a fool to come back here. Stupid man. A lady sniper, huh? Didn't you know that two-thirds of the world's greatest assassins are women? Do you want to die now? Or after your female friend? Which will it be? I'll die after I kill you. Is that right? Well, at least you've got spirit. I am Sniper Wolf. And I always kill what I aim at. Oh, you're my... Special prey. You're my special friend. Got it. Huh. Oh, I've left my mark on you. I won't forget it. Until I kill you. You're all I think about. Take him away. We're then dragged back along the passage before we hear Liquid Snake's voice, before awakening onto some bright lights. I took this opportunity to make as much noise as possible. Oslot is also here, and Liquid says we stole his genes, and he's very excited that we finally get to meet. He refers to us as brothers of light and dark. He believes Snake got all of the good genes and he was left with all the bad ones, so he has this vendetta against him for it. Wolf and Liquid discuss whether the US are planning to give in before they notice that we are awake. He tells us how we were both the only surviving sons of Big Boss. But he gets a call from Raven interrupting this exposition and Liquid is very upset that they're not willing to negotiate. To which he decides that they're going to actually go through with it. Liquid tells Ocelot not to bloody kill us like he did with the DARPA chief. Liquid then leaves. Wolf confirms that Meryl is alive in some form before calling us handsome and leaving to go play with her dogs. Ocelot talks about how obsessed she becomes with her targets, sometimes falling in love with them before she kills them. She's a really complex character, Sniper Wolf, and she's dripping in pixelated sex appeal. We'll touch more on Wolf later. Uh, no pun intended. This is the start of the famous torture scene. Ocelot has packed up our things and wants to torture us for information. Ocelot has some initial questions around the optical disc and whether there was a copy. He reveals that they know there is some kind of trick behind the PAL key, but doesn't know what the trick is, and neither do we. So, 
This torture scene I never actually completed until this playthrough. Our young boy hands just were not strong enough for the torture that is about to ensue. I remembered it being so so hard because of this, and although I still would say this is hard, it's definitely very beatable. I'm gonna come. I beat the first round and Ocelot commends us for being very very strong. <laughs> He then reminds us how cool it is that Liquid shot down two F-16s with a hind, and that he's the only man that could make Ocelot's dream a reality. This dream would be an ongoing thread throughout the rest of the series, which maybe we'll touch on in future videos because it's uh, major spoilers. But it at least tells us that there's a motive for Ocelot to be working with Liquid, other than the fact he's just a bad guy. This little fish hook of characterization by Kojima is a great touch, and yeah, I'll say it again, would become very typical Kojima. He's great at leaving little teasing breadcrumbs of his story elements throughout his games, sometimes only noticed when replayed, which is another cool element of the series. We're then sent back to our cell, along with the rotten corpse of the real DARPA chief. We're then let loose in the cell, which is actually a really fun part of the game. You can't do much, but the stuff you can do is fun and always leads to a reaction by the guard or an event happening. You can crawl under your bed, which just flat out confuses the guard if he sees you do it. Or you can, like me, repeatedly knock on the door and he'll relentlessly tell you to shut up. There, I noticed that this guard's voice was the same one from earlier, outside the DARPA chief's cell. This is confirmed by his voice, but also his similarly pathetic behaviour, like needing to shit himself every five minutes. We then have a call from Roy, who confesses that he lied to us, again. <laughs> Snake asks him why he did it, but he's tight-lipped on the true motive of the mission. Snake presses, why don't the US just give over Big Boss's remains to save the threat of a nuclear attack? But he says it's because of the bad press from the genome army tests that the US doesn't want. Snake doesn't believe this, and rightly so. Snake confirms that he will save Meryl for this lying old rat before we hang up. Right, back to causing nuisance in the cell. I call Otacon because the smell of the DARPA chief reminded me of his piss pants, Otacon surprisingly says he can help. I tried to become a helicopter as a backup plan, but I'm not quick enough and we're called in again for interrogation. Ocelot tells us a bit more about himself, that he used to be called Shalashaska, which I totally got in one take, previously which is a nice nod to MGS5 and tells us why he's involved. He wants Russia to lead a new world order. After getting through this again, we're sent back to the cell. There's a really cool moment that I experienced actually for the first time after beating the torture for the second time. Snake says his arm hurts, and so does mine from jamming that button to keep us alive. But Naomi says she'll up the dose of our painkillers and tells us to put the controller on our arm where it hurts, and then she vibrates our controller to soothe the pain. This is probably the most mind-blowing fourth wall break I've ever experienced, because my arm actually did hurt and the vibration actually soothed it. If anyone can show me a better example of immersion, like ever, I'll be surprised. Let me know in the comments if you have an example of something you might think tops this. These little touches are just so fantastic, and while they are just that, little touches, the execution, innovation and volume of them build into the overall experience, and I absolutely love it. Snake wants Naomi to take his mind off the pain, and they end up speaking about family again with this superb soundtrack behind it. I don't have any family. No. Wait. There was a man who said he was my father. Where is he? Dead. By my own hand. Big Boss. What? Big Boss? I had no idea. There was no way you could. It happened in Zanzibar six years ago. Only Snake and I know the real truth of what happened there. So, is it true? Was Big Boss really your father? So, now we know that Snake's father was Big Boss. Not in the traditional way though. They took this ultimate soldier gene to use in the Les Enfants Terribles project as part of the genome therapy research. So they tried to create more big bosses and Liquid and Solid are the only remaining children of this, as we understand it to this point. We also find out that Snake killed Big Boss, as Naomi points out, committing petricide, and he seems quite unremorseful about this. As he says, he wanted it. Naomi goes on to talk about her family, which consists only of a dead brother which she doesn't talk too much about. She clearly harbours a lot of pain about this subject. You might have noticed by this point she seems a lot more interested in Snake's morals on this mission than a standard doctor would. She seems to take personal issue with his attitude to killing, which isn't really part of her job to do. Snake goes on to say that Grey Fox is one of his only friends, which shocks her again. 
She can't work out how this can be when she knows that they fought to the death back in Zanzibar. Snake says that it was nothing personal and they were just unfortunate to be on opposing sides. Naomi thinks this is insane, but then explaining this by his genetic disposition towards violence. We learn why Naomi got into genetic research as she never knew who her parents were and thought studying in this field might reveal some answers. We then get some key information that runs as an undercurrent to this story. Naomi says that a person's genetic fate is predetermined by the sequence of the four bases in their DNA. Snake asks what fate is, and Naomi suddenly cuts the conversation short after claiming not to know. We'll revisit this topic later. Back to breaking out of the cell. The guard once again has a bad case of the poopies which allows Hal to sneak in. Snake shakes him unnecessarily and then Hal gives us some fish and ketchup. Hal is experiencing some conflicting emotions. He talks about how Sniper Wolf is a good person. Snake reminds him that she shot Meryl. I think we've all been here when we're teens slash young adults. We like the hot girl and maybe she shows us some affection. So we might justify any of their misgivings or character faults because she's hot and she might like us. Our judgement is clouded by the potential for love. It's something that we grow out of by going through it. It's an interesting little story arc because it really exemplifies how much of a virgin Hal really is. And as funny as that sounds saying out loud, it's great storytelling as most of us gamers can relate to it. It shows as an adult that Hal might be a supermind when it comes to nuclear science. But in love, he's just a child. This is further developed by Hal refusing to get the key from the guard. He's no soldier. Probably the only character in this game that we meet that won't willingly kill someone. Snake is quite confused by this. Killing is just a means of progression and getting what you want in this game. Yet he meets someone who isn't willing to do that and he runs away. Next we try to squirt the ketchup on the floor and lie in it, which in an action slash sneaking game is another great little switch up to the immersive sim style of problem solving. The guard thinks we have died or been injured and rushes into the cell to see what's going on. And what follows is actually so embarrassing and had never happened to me on a playthrough before. I thought he would fight me when I got up, but the little bitch just ran away and locked the door and pretended like nothing happened. I actually didn't know what to do next, but I knew this meant I had to go through another round of torture, which we do also make it through. The guard runs off for another poopy as I tried to break the sound barrier by rotating. The ninja then opens the door for us. We beat up the guard and then show him what my balls look like before going into the torture room to get our stuff back. When we emerge out of this room, we're back in B1 where the DARPA chief was held initially. I take this opportunity to head back down to B2, using our access card level 6 to resupply on stuff before Deep Throat calls us to say that a bomb was placed on our items, which we need to throw away. With that, we forward back track back through the forward track area we've already backtracked through to uh, <clears throat> progress again, I guess. We can go down to B2, underneath the warhead storage facility to resupply and get the body armour. This time when we meet the Waffles, we can equip Sniper Wolf's handkerchief so they don't attack us. A very nice and useful detail. As Otacon said, she can't be a bad person. She likes dogs. It makes us think. We then pass Meryl's bloodstain and have a flashback to her being shot. This is to re-emphasize the development of feelings that Snake is having. This is in complete opposition to his genetic code that we were discussing with Naomi. We call Roy and Snake shows some real empathy. The whole gang then calls us to tell us not to worry about it. You're Snake, you're a legend. Meryl wouldn't want you to be upset. Snake admits out loud to Naomi that she is special to him. It seems he has fallen in love on a battlefield of all places, but he won't say that out loud just yet. We also get a little more information about Naomi's family, and Master Miller seems to probe a little at this, saying that he thought she didn't know her family. There is definitely something up with Naomi and her family at this stage. We cannot help but feel like this is a key story arc developing as the topic keeps coming up, but for now, we don't know what. We then do this. And we won't talk about this ever again. We then get to the top of the communications tower and we're treated to this epic cutscene.
enemy fog. down. If only I had a rope. I should be able to use that rope I got. What are you going to do? Take on a hind with your bare hands? Now you're mine! If I stay here, I'm finished. We are forced to abseil down the comms tower to the outside walkway, the only way to get across to the other side. It's an awesome action scene where we feel like the legendary Solid Snake. We have to avoid gunfire from Liquid whilst doing this. The soundtrack kicks in and we're off. When we get to the bottom, there are three weird guards just standing still at the end of the walkway that apparently can survive Nikita rockets to the face. We get fired up by Liquid again before making it to safety in the other tower. In this tower we have to scale a ton of stairs down to the elevator, but we find the staircase is broken on the exact floor that the elevator is on. We hear some spooky noises that make snakes say, Huh? Then we encounter Hal and assume the noises were just him. We then have this cutscene. How'd you get here? Well, it wasn't as dramatic as your entrance, believe me. I'm afraid of heights. You were watching? Yeah, I was watching. I was riding in the back of their truck, thanks to the stealth camouflage. How did you get up here? The elevator, of course. The first floor of the circular staircase was destroyed. That's why I took the elevator. The elevator was working? Yeah, that's right. You're incredible. Like a movie hero or something. No, you're wrong. In the movies, the hero always saves the girl. You mean Meryl? Sorry. Forget I said anything. Snake, there's something I've really got to ask you. It's why I followed you up this far. Have you ever... loved someone? That's what you came to ask? No, I mean, I... I was wondering if even soldiers fall in love. What are you trying to say? I want to ask you. Do you think love can bloom even on a battlefield? Yeah, I do. I think at any time, any place, people can fall in love with each other. But if you love someone, you have to be able to protect them. I think so too. I have a favor to ask. Uh-oh. Don't worry, it'll be easy. Um, uh, I told you before, I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want you to either. Okay. The elevator is stopped down there. I want you to get it to move. You see? That's weird. It was working before, but now it isn't. Maybe the panel's broken. Can you fix it? It was working before. If it's the mechanism, leave it to me. I've got to go and swat a noisy fly. Okay. I'll stay here and hold the fort. Good luck. You really look like hell. Are you okay? Don't worry. If I do this, it doesn't matter. I just pretend like I'm not here. And then I'm not scared. Strange logic. I'm counting on you. We can see these elements of love and compassion in Snake's character are really starting to come to the forefront of the story. We then go back to being a badass by saying we need to go swat a noisy fly. When we reach the top of the tower, we hear the low swirl of helicopter blades and see this. So, the snake's finally come out of this hole. Are you ready now, my brother? Why are you calling me brother? Who the hell are you? I'm you. I'm your shadow. What? 
Ask the father that you kill. I'll send you to hell to meet him. The Hind fight is probably one of my favourites, mainly due to the fact it's just so epic. It really helps if you have stereo sound for this, as you can hear where the hind is, and whether it's lower down or higher up where you can shoot it. Not everyone had stereo sound, so it's another cool touch for the time to add to the long list. Liquid mostly fires the machine gun at us, and occasionally saying, eat this, before sending rockets our way. It's a tight boss fight and I really like it, mainly for the cutscene after you beat it. Such a cheesy and epic line. I love it. Howell calls us to tell us the elevator's working, and he thinks we're really sexy and hot for destroying the helicopter, and we casually make our way back down to the elevator. Once we reach the elevator, we call it, whilst I do this funny little dance. When we get in, a buzzer goes off, as Otacon calls us. Snake, there's something I forgot to tell you before. What? There were five stealth camouflage prototypes in my lab. Yeah, so? If you take out the one I'm wearing, that leaves four. Hey, this isn't first grade math class. I thought I'd get one for you. So I went back to the lab and... Yeah? The four suits were missing. Also, about the elevator that I checked out, it's really strange. It was like someone was intentionally holding it. When you were riding on it, did the weight limit warning go off? That's another thing that bothered me about it. The warning went off, and I know I couldn't be over the limit. How much do you weigh? About 135, but that elevator had a weight limit of 650 pounds. It would take at least five people to go over that limit. Look out, Snake! The guys who stole my stealth prototypes are in there with you! Too late, Snake! Now die! Bruh, I got so scared when this music kicked in, I had no clue what was going on, and when Otacon's face did this, I was so shook up as a kid. I always dreaded this part of the game, obviously now I can handle it, but I always remember the fear that Kojima created, and it's really unexpected. Snake lets out a little sigh before we get to the bottom, all in a day's work for this legend. We run through to another snowfield. I actually have PTSD at this point from being blown up by mines so many times that I whip out my mine detector before I'm shot instead. Here we have battle number two with Sniper Wolf. I found this one a bit easier. She's harder to find initially, but once you get her in your sights, along with the previous experience of fighting her, this one's a bit easier. We have a quick codec call with Otacon and Sniper Wolf herself, where again, he begs us not to kill her. Snake can't really see the logic in this, and to be honest, neither can I. She started it. Besides, as we have touched on before, Otacon is clouded by lust, and just doesn't want to lose that love and affection that he likely has never had before, and probably thinks he'll never have again. Then, it's go time. I used the thermal goggles to help find her initially. She actually quick scopes me on that second shot there, which made me lose her, and try repositioning. This is when she's at her most dangerous. I switch sides of the map as I can see where her laser is coming from, and then set my sights on her. We traded shots a couple of times, while staying patient for her to run out. She actually manages to shoot me through the terrain once, which was really annoying. So I repositioned to get a better angle and made sure I was quick to go with her movement, predicting her next move is key to winning here, if she'll peek right or left. I pre-aimed it and hard scoped her for the win. We are treated to this cutscene. Waited for this moment. I am a sniper. Waiting is my job. Never moving a muscle. Concentrating. <laughs> I am long shot. You cannot save me. 
please. Just finish me quick. I am a card. I have always dreamed of a peaceful place like this. A curd? So that's why you're called Wolf. I was born on a battlefield. Raised on a battlefield. Gunfire, sirens, and screams. They were my lullabies. Hunted like dogs, day after day. Driven from our ragged shelters. That was my life. Each morning I'd wake up and find a few more of my family or friends dead beside me. I'd stare at the morning sun and pray to make it through the day. The governments of the world turned a blind eye to our misery. But then, he appeared. My hero. Saladin. He took me away from all that. Saladin? You mean Big Boss? I became a sniper. Hidden. Watching everything through a rifle scope. Now I could see war. Not from inside, but from the outside. As an observer, I watched the brutality, the stupidity of mankind through the scope of my rifle. I joined this group of revolutionaries to take my revenge on the world. I have shamed myself and my people. I am no longer the wolf I was born to be. In the name of vengeance, I sold my body and my soul. Now I am nothing more than a dog. Wolves are noble animals. They're not like dogs. Yupik, the word for wolf is Keglinek, and the Aluts revere them as honorable cousins. They call mercenaries like us dogs of war. It's true, we're all for sale at some price or another, but you're different, untamed, solitary. You're no dog, you're a wolf. Who are you? Are you Saladin? Wolf. You spared Meryl's life. She... she was never my real target. I don't kill for sport. Rest easy. You'll die as the proud wolf you are. I finally understand. I wasn't waiting to kill people. I was waiting for someone to kill me. Snake, you said that love could bloom. 
room on the battlefield. But I couldn't save her. What are you doing? Returning it to its owner. I don't need a handkerchief. Why? I don't have any more tears to shed. <gasps> I'm going to the underground base. We're out of time. I know. You'll have to protect yourself now. Don't trust anyone. Yeah. If I can't stop Metal Gear, this whole place will probably be bombed to hell. Yeah. We might not meet again. I'll hang on to my codec. I want to keep helping. You can leave any time. Get a head start. A head start on your new life. Snake! What was she fighting for? What am I fighting for? What are you fighting for? If we make it through this, I'll tell you. Okay. I'll be searching too. I'm in tears. Anyway, I found it funny, linking back to my earlier point, that Otacon is so upset but she barely even acknowledges him. She probably baits him too by reaching out to what we think is him, but asking for her gun instead. And on that solemn note, we progress. We grab some supplies from the various sheds, when I'm blown up by an overdue mine, once again giving me severe paranoia that they are everywhere. After this, we progress down to Disc 2, baby! The best thing about Disc 2 is that it means we'll no longer need to be backtracking beyond this point. The worst thing? There is still backtracking to come. We enter the blast furnace room, similar to the nuclear warhead storage hangar and setup. A sneaky area to get some resupplies, but instead of nukes, there is now fire, which I just had to take a dip in thanks to the controls being so janky. You need to edge across the ledge here to avoid the cranes and it's a little bit of a puzzle to solve if you're super dumb or super young like I was when I first got stuck here. That's the only real issues you're going to face here. We step out into a cargo elevator room place thing and you pick up some more resupplies before being ambushed as we descend. Another epic elevator battle later, we arrive at another cargo elevator place hangar storage facility area thing to take another cargo elevator down, not before being caught out by you guessed it, yet another landmine. Uh. We get a call from Miller to reveal some info about Naomi. She's also been lying. He thinks she's a spy due to some racially based evidence. He theorizes that she is working with the terrorists. We play with some birds on the elevator before we arrive in Antarctica. Hmm, I wonder who's in the next room. Welcome, Cossack. This is the end of the road for you. Right, my friends? Listen, they agree. How dare you kill my friends? This boss was actually really scary back in the day. He has a load of health and moves quite quickly whilst destroying the arena as he goes. You have to move quick and avoid meeting him. His pathfinding isn't predictable at all. It's not necessarily good, but the unpredictability is what makes it better. If he sees you, he will gun you down, like, really hard. You can set C4 or Claymores, but he might avoid that path altogether and you might end up having to set multiple and forget where they are. Then you run the risk of running over them yourself, or detonating the C4 while you're next to it. It's a great fight with some great dynamics to it. As you do more damage and the fight goes on, he'll get faster and more aggressive, as well as knocking down the containers to block off your escape routes. All in all, a great fight and makes use of a variety of weapons. I ended up finishing him off in a really silly way. I laid a final claymore to be clever, and he shot me to the ground without rounding the corner properly, which means I actually picked the claymore up. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 
So I actually finally used my FAMAS at point blank to kill him. We then get this cutscene. Just as the boss said, it is my existence which is no longer needed in this world. But my body will not remain in this place. My spirit and my flesh will become one with the ravens. In that way, I will return to Mother Earth who bore me. Snake! I will be watching you, understand? Snake, take this security card. It will open that door. Why? You are a snake which was not created by nature. You and the boss. You are from another world. A world that I do not wish to know. Go and do battle with him. I will be watching from above. First, I'll give you a hint. The man who you saw die before your eyes. He copied his subjects down to the blood. So he drained the chief's blood and took it into himself. But he wasn't able to deceive the Angel of Death. The Angel of Death? Why go to so much trouble? Why impersonate the chief? <laughs> that is the end of my hint. You must solve the rest of the riddle yourself. Snake, in the natural world, there is no such thing as boundless slaughter. There is always an end to it. But you are different. What are you trying to say? The path you walk on has no end. Each step you take is paved with the corpses of your enemies. Their souls will haunt you forever. You shall have no peace. Hear me, Snake. My spirit will be watching. We then get a call from Miller to further elaborate on Naomi's background. He reveals that the real Naomi Hunter disappeared in the Middle East, and that she must have obtained her papers somehow and replaced her. The more revealing part of this conversation, however, is that Roy is more than reasonably worried about the fact that she's been so close to him for this operation, again suggesting that Roy knows more than he's letting on. Snake catches onto this and gets sassy with Roy. We assume Naomi is going to be placed under arrest, we resupply and push on. We come to an unnecessary room full of cameras and trap doors. The room serves absolutely no purpose that I'm aware of and there are a comical amount of cameras. In the next room there's no music and we finally come face to face with Metal Gear. So we have to scale Metal Gear and talk to Otacon a bit along the way. He's trying to access Baker's security files to find more information on Rex, the PAL keys, and any ways to disable it. We have a number of calls with him about this until we reach the control room. Otacon provides some information on how Metal Gear gets around international treaties, the railgun and nuke combo, it doesn't use fuel so it isn't considered a missile, and it's also a stealth weapon as it doesn't burn any propellant, so it cannot be picked up by any missile detection systems. This is a well-timed bit of exposition as we're approaching the end of the game. 
It's adding weight to the threat of Metal Gear and what feels like real world context to how this was all possible. Roy concedes that he knew this all along, again, much to the disappointment of Snake. We take out the guard before Otacon calls again and confirms what Baker said to us back when we fought Ocelot. The conspiracy is all confirmed and laid out to us if we hadn't figured it out already. We arrive at the control room and here Liquid and Ocelot discuss this. We've entered the PAL codes and disengaged the safety device. We can launch any time. There's still no response from Washington. It looks like we'll have to show them that we mean business. Should I set it for Chernerton, Russia? No, there's been a change. The new target is Lopnor, China. Why, boss? I'm sure neither you nor Mr. Golukovich would really like to see a nuclear bomb dropped on your motherland, right? Liquid. But why? There's nothing there. Wrong. It's a nuclear test site. A nuclear test site? If we nuke a major population center, the game's over. But a nuclear explosion at a test site can still be concealed from the public. Meanwhile, Washington will be worried about the retaliatory strike from China. That'll probably mean top secret talks between both countries' leaders. Of course. And in the process, the President will be forced to divulge the existence of a new and highly destabilizing nuclear weapon to the Chinese. What do you think that will do to the U.S.'s reputation? Or the President's? And with the CTBT, that means that China and India, I see. Yes. When the other countries hear about this new weapon, they'll all want to contact us. Washington won't be very happy when we start selling their own system to the highest bidders. Yes, the president will break. He will give in to our demands. Big Boss's DNA and one billion dollars. Billion dollars? That money will be used to cure our genome soldiers as well. I'm also including the Fox Dye vaccine in our demands. Fox Dye. It killed Octopus and the Armstech president. So it's true that it affects older people first. Mantis might not have been affected because he wore a mask. Wolf wasn't infected either. Perhaps due to those tranquilizers she always took. Something to do with the adrenaline level in the blood. Or maybe it's just because this fox dye was still experimental and they haven't worked out all the bugs yet. In any case, have you heard from your friend, Colonel Sergei Golukovich, at the Spetsnaz? He still has doubts about the ability of Metal Gear. He said we can talk after Metal Gear's test launch. We now know what has been causing those heart attacks. It's called Fox Dye. Liquid and Ocelot are still perplexed to the pattern in which it kills them. Liquid also makes a reference to Golukovich, who features in MGS2, which is another cool future reference I hadn't picked up on before. its position as a military superpower, they need to reinforce their nuclear arsenal. They need a nuclear weapon that can't be intercepted. Metal Gear will allow them to gain first strike capability over the rest of the world. Their regular army is in shambles, and they think they can restore their country's military power with nuclear weapons? Golukovich, he's no warrior. He's a politician. Well, he's the one who gave us the hind and most of our other heavy firepower. He's got over a thousand soldiers under his command. If we join forces, we could put up quite a resistance here. Since Mantis died, the genome soldier's brainwashing has started to wear off. I'm worried about the men's morale. An alliance with the Russians would boost that as well. What do you say? We're not going anywhere. We're going to dig in here. We could still escape. We've got the most powerful weapon ever made, and we're about to ally with Golukovich's forces. Are you going to fight the whole world? And what's wrong with that? We can launch a nuclear warhead at any target on this planet. A nuclear warhead invisible to radar. And on top of that, this base is full of spare nuclear warheads. Once we get the DNA and the money... Liquid, in partnership with the Russians, wants to dig in in Shadow Moses. He's worried about the genome boy's morale and thinks this is the answer to all their problems. With a nuclear threat like Metal Gear Rex, a Russian ex-genome army, and a strong base of operations, Liquid wants to stay here. He says he will call this place Outer Heaven. And Snake retorts, Big Boss's Dream. If you've played the other games in the series, you'll understand this more, but for the sake of this game's story, it's not majorly important. But it's also interesting how Kojima seemed to have this all written from the start, 
multiple references to games that were released 20 odd years later is really impressive. It almost feels like I'm playing the latest game in the series with how well connected all of the game's stories are even at this initial stage. Once more, bravo. We see that Ocelot has noticed us on the surveillance camera, but for some reason he doesn't react. We also find out that Meryl is definitely alive. We get a call from Otacon describing how the keys work. They can only be used once, and if they're inserted when the system is active, it deactivates it, and vice versa the other way around. But being able to only use this once makes it pretty... I'm going to say it, it's, it's stupid. So yeah. The key, bit of info here, <laughs> key bit of info. <laughs> is that the PAL key is made from shape memory alloys, so we don't need to use three keys. This one will just change shape to fit the different slot. One shape is its ambient temperature as we have it now, the other is in its hot form and the other is cold. Ocelot shoots the key out of our hand and the key flies over the rails. We have to go and get that key. After dispatching of the guards and going back down to the ground floor, we find it! Hooray! Yay. I accidentally chaffed myself in the face before climbing back up these ladders for the third time. Yeah, we're going to be doing this a lot more. When we get back to the control room, Liquid and Ocelot are gone. I've always wondered why they just left at this point. It links back to when we fought Raven in the snowfield. They seem to just be letting us do this. Anyway, next we need to do some completely boring backtracking here. I was so sick of climbing up and down these ladders a million times to complete this section, as well as riding the long ass cargo elevators. Especially when the ladders are really hard to climb. And you know what? I'm going to spare you from this and use the power of editing to just speed this all up. During this section we end up getting a lot of exposition on Fox Dive from Miller. He believes Naomi is responsible for the Fox Dive virus. Roy confirms that he's put her under arrest for sending coded messages towards the Alaskan base, i.e. Shadow Moses where we are. Miller hints that we might be infected too, but Snake doesn't catch on to this at this point. After we've finished heating the card up, we'll go all the way back to Metal Gear's hangar to climb some ladders and put an end to this. Before we get there, we get a call from Naomi. She admits that most of the theorizing is correct, but tells us that the story about why she got into genetics was true, and she reveals that her big brother was Grey Fox. This was something that was hinted at earlier when we fought Grey Fox and got tortured. I want to include this part of the codec call because the soundtrack and dialogue is just beautiful. Yes, Frank Yeager. The man who you destroyed was my brother and my only family. No. Grey Fox? We survived that hill together, Frank and I. He protected me. He's my one connection. The only connection I have to my past. And he brought you back to America? No. I was in Mozambique when he came. Who was he? You mean Big Boss? Yes. He brought us to this land of freedom, this America. And then he and my brother went back to Africa to continue the war. And that's when it happened. You killed my benefactor and sent my brother home a cripple. I vowed revenge and joined Foxhound. I knew it was my best chance to meet you and I prayed for the day that I would. So, were your prayers answered? Naomi says that her motive from the beginning has been to kill Snake. There's a fine old line between wanting to kill someone and sleep with them in this game, as we've seen with Sniper Wolf and now Naomi. It ties into what Snake said earlier about Grey Fox. Naomi now admits that she was partly wrong about Snake after working with him on this mission. She then tells us some more about Fox Die, which is pretty hard to explain, so I'm just gonna let Naomi do it. Retrovirus that targets and kills only specific people. First, it infects the macrophages in the victim's body. Fox dye contains smart enzymes created through protein engineering. They're programmed to respond to specific genetic patterns in the cells. Those enzymes recognize the target's DNA? Right. They respond by becoming active and using the macrophages they begin creating TNF Epsilon. Huh? It's a type of cytokine, a peptide which causes cells to die. The TNF Epsilon is carried along the bloodstream to the heart, where they attach to the TNF receptors in the heart cells. And then, they cause a heart attack? The heart cells suffer a shock and undergo an extreme apoptosis. Then, the victim dies. Apoptosis? You mean the heart cells commit suicide? 
Naomi. What? You must have programmed that thing to kill me too, right? The long and short of this call is that Naomi programmed Fox Die to kill Snake too, but it wasn't her call. It was part of the operation from the beginning. For me, that's the final nail in the coffin for Roy. What a bastard, man. Snake considered him one of his only friends and he betrayed him, time after time. Naomi wanted to tell Snake something before she is caught by the guards. I did some research on this and there are two main possibilities, I think, for what Naomi was going to say to Snake. One is that Naomi is going to confess her feelings for Snake, which I find unlikely, as she said her perception has only slightly changed of him, and she's barely met him at all, apart from the briefing scene. Two, remember Miller said Naomi could be working as part of another unknown organization? Well, in further games, you'll understand that there is a shadow government of sorts called the Patriots. No spoilers for this game, or the next really, plus it's been about a thousand years now, so you should have played it already. The second option would make more sense that Naomi was going to confess this all along. It fits the confessional tone of the conversation and would make sense that she would reveal this to him as she's been telling him the truth throughout the entire conversation and makes sense when the whole series is wrapped up. If this second option is true, whether retconned or not, I think is absolutely genius and testament to Kojima's intricate storytelling. Anyway, we're back to the Metal Gear hangar now through the power of editing and we're ready to insert the last card. Thank you, Snake. Now the detonation code is completed. Nothing can stop Metal Gear now. Master, what's going on? You found the key, and even activated the warhead for us too. I really must express my gratitude. Sorry to have involved you in that silly shape memory alloy business. What are you talking about? We weren't able to learn the DARPA chief's code. Even with Mantis' psychic powers, he couldn't read his mind. Then Ocelot accidentally killed him during the interrogation. In other words, we weren't able to launch the nuclear device and we were all getting a little worried. Without the threat of a nuclear strike, our demands would never be met. What do you mean? Without the detonation codes, we had to find some other way. That's when we decided you might prove useful, Snake. What? First, I thought we might get the information from you, Snake, so I had Decoy Octopus disguise himself as the DARPA chief. Unfortunately, Octopus didn't survive the encounter, thanks to Fox Die. You mean you had this plan from the beginning, just to get me to input the detonation code? Huh? <laughs> you didn't think you made it this far by yourself, did you? Who the hell are you? In any case, the launch preparations are complete. Once the world glimpses the power of this weapon, the White House will have no choice but to surrender the Fox Dime vaccine to me. Their ace in the hole is useless now. Ace in the hole? The Pentagon's plan to use you was already successful in the torture room. <laughs> Snake, you're the only one who doesn't know. Ah, oh, poor fool. Who are you anyway? I'll tell you everything you want to know. If you come where I am, that is. Where are you? Very close by. Snake! That's not Master Miller. Campbell, you're too late. Master Miller's body was just discovered at his home. He's been dead for at least three days. I didn't know because my codec link with Master was cut off, but Mei Ling said his transmission signal was coming from inside the base. So who is it? Snake, you've been talking to me, dear brother. Served your purpose, you may die now. 
We're once again locked in a cell of sorts, and getting gassed this time, which is a nice bonus. We call Otacon and get him to unlock the door, and we exit the room to encounter Liquid. Liquid! Snake! Did you like my sunglasses? You'd point a weapon at your own brother? Why did you disguise yourself as master? So I could manipulate you more easily. And you performed quite well, I must say. Although the boys at the Pentagon are probably saying the same thing. What the hell are you talking about? Following orders blindly, with no questions asked, you've lost your warrior's pride and become nothing more than a pawn snake. What? Stopping the nuclear launch, rescuing the hostages, it was all just a diversion. A diversion? The Pentagon only needed for you to come into contact with us. That's what killed the arms tech president and decoy octopus. You don't mean... That's right. You were sent here to kill us so they could retrieve Metal Gear undamaged, along with the bodies of the genome soldiers. From the beginning, the Pentagon was just using you as a vector to spread Fox Die. Fox Die? It can't be. Are you telling me Naomi was working with the Pentagon? They thought she was, but it seems that Dr. Naomi Hunter couldn't be controlled so easily. What? We've got a spy working in the Pentagon. He reported that Dr. Hunter altered Fox Dye's program just before the operation, but no one knows how or why. I wonder. Maybe they arrested her so they could find out the answer to that. No doubt. But I had no idea she was motivated by such petty revenge. We still don't know what changes she made to Fox Dye's program. Oh well, it doesn't matter. I've already added the Fox Dye vaccine to my list of White House demands. There's a vaccine? There must be, but that woman is the only one who really knows. Anyway, it might prove to be unnecessary. Why is that? You were successful in coming into contact with all of us, so we must have all been exposed to the virus. It's true that the Armstead President and Decoy Octopus were killed by Fox Dye, but Ocelot, myself, and you, the carrier, were apparently unaffected. A bug in the virus's programming? Hmm. Could be. In any case, if it doesn't kill you, then I'm not worried either. After all, our genetic code is identical. So it's true. You and I are... Yes, twins. But we're not ordinary twins. We're twins linked by cursed genes. Les enfants terribles. <laughs> You're fine. You got all the old man's dominant genes. I got the flawed recessive genes. Everything was done so that you would be the greatest of his children. The only reason I exist is so they could create you. I was the favorite, huh? That's right. I'm just the leftovers of what they used to make you. Can you understand what it's like to know that you're garbage since the day you were born? But I'm the one Father chose. So that's why you're so obsessed with Big Boss. Some warped kind of love. Love? It's hate! He always told me I was inferior. And now I'll have my revenge! <laughs> you should understand me, brother. You killed our father with your own hands! You stole my chance for revenge! Now I'll finish the work that father began. I will surpass him! I will destroy him! You're just like Naomi. Well, I'm not like you! Unlike you, I'm proud of the destiny that is encoded into my very genes! Yeah!
So yeah, uh, a lot to digest there, but we have no time to think about it really as we're thrusted into battle with Metal Gear Rex, the final showdown, you would think. You will need a good stack of rations for this one. I didn't have a real reliable strategy for this boss, just stinger missiling it at every opportunity that I got, and doing my best to avoid the missiles and laser penis attack. Yes, it is a laser penis attack. Don't ask any questions, just accept it. Once its health bar is depleted, we see this. then put in control with an opportunity to finish Liquid, however this will also kill Grey Fox, debatably Snake's only ever friend. Even if we do try to fire, Snake will say he can't. Man, he prayed for 
You see, you can't protect anyone, not even yourself. Die! Right, you've really done it now, Liquid, you little topless freak. By this point in the story, me and Snake are one man. My blood's boiling up, and I'm pissed that he just killed my only ever friend. I don't care if you've got a giant T-Rex nuke machine, I'm gonna floor you, pal. Rex's health is back to full, and I just go in say no mode, not even waiting for the lock-on on the Stinger missiles. I was just quick scoping in with this thing, the definition of you won't like me when I'm angry. Snake, I'll crush you into dust! The explosion knocks us back, and somehow Liquid walks out alive to capture us. We await to see a bloodied Liquid monologuing about his motivations and intentions for doing what he's doing. He feels unvalued, that war has changed and they don't need people like him and Snake anymore. He wants to bring the world back to a state like this, where he is valued. A world of chaos and honour. He wants to play a part in this new world, just like Big Boss's vision, to feel important, again, and be in a world that is full of conflicts to validate his existence. Snake says he doesn't want this world, but Liquid rebuts this, asking why he is on the mission in the first place. Is it because he enjoys all of the killing? Is Snake really that different to Liquid, or are they two of the same on different sides of a war? One is honest with himself, and maybe the other is not. This plays back to what Raven said. Snake has been accused by our own team, and bosses alike throughout this game, of being a sort of controlled monster, and he confirms this himself that he's just a killer multiple times, not to romanticise this. Liquid goes on to talk about the Les Enfants Terrible project which we mentioned at the start of the video, an artificial process to create the perfect soldier. Using Big Boss's genes, they created eight babies, then killed all of them apart from two to make them even stronger. Liquid says they were accomplices in murder before they were even born. Then it's revealed to our knowledge that Liquid was given all of the recessive genes through a vague process I, to be honest, don't fully understand leaving Snake with 100% of the best genes of Big Boss. Liquid harbours a primordial sort of hatred for Snake for this, claiming that he stole his birthright to a fair set of genes. He also reveals that the genome soldiers we've been killing all this time are genetically modified from Big Boss's genes, so they are essentially our brothers to some extent. The way they explain how the US figured out to do this is quite interesting. Liquid says it's a result of human experiments and sacrifices, and they link it back to the Gulf War Syndrome. Liquid says the US injected Gulf War soldiers with the said genes during this war. Then the Gulf War Syndrome illness, which is a real world illness, said to cause fatigue, muscle pain, cognitive problems, insomnia, rashes and diarrhea, was actually a result of this failed experiment. The real world explanation of this syndrome was, according to this game, all a cover up for the genome therapy experiments. All the babies born of these veterans also had defects and they were known as Gulf War babies. Liquid said they, too, are our brothers and sisters. On top of this, Liquid then also ties back to real-world biological symmetry theory. Species that show more signs of symmetry and lack of diversity are at more risk of extinction. Diseases arise throughout history and unfortunately kill large numbers of people. What makes a species resilient is genetic diversity. As the disease's programming will target only a certain set of DNA, in a diverse species this will match for less people or animals than in a species with less diversity. If there is a disease that kills one genome soldier due to the identical DNA across the board, in theory it should wipe them all out. This is why although on the surface the result of the Gulf War experiments did yield the results they wanted, their time is limited. Could fox die be an attempt at creating this virus? Before I go on, this is absolutely mind-blowing if you think about it. MGS1 is famous for treading a fine line between based firmly in realism and getting a bit anime here and there, but to link the story of the game into a conspiracy dating back 20 years, as well as being able to tie it into real-world biological science and to have it make relative sense, is absolutely extraordinary storytelling from Kojima. He's light years ahead of the other game and movie directors in 1998, and actually gets his audience to question everything they hear on the news through this revelation, something he would double down on in future entries in the series. 
Back into the game, and Liquid's not done with his biological science. He explains the reason for wanting Big Boss's DNA is to attempt to save his genetic brothers and sisters. He explains this again with another real-life genetic theory, that of the selfish gene. This is the theory that we'll act to protect our brothers and sisters that share common traits and genes with us, essentially explaining why we have such close bonds with our family, and act to protect them and ensure their survival. This is where we see a split in Snake and Liquid's character. Liquid is acting purely as ordered by his genes, essentially, as we've just covered. But Snake has showed signs of acting differently. He showed compassion, love and understanding. These things are not typical of the ultimate soldier, you would think, but we'll revisit this idea before the end of the video. Liquid then says he's going to kill us, and we're shown Meryl before we get a call from Roy. He somewhat redeems his actions here by delaying the bombing run, and we're told he was being manipulated by the Pentagon to do their bidding as was Snake. They were both just pawns in the larger game. We're then introduced to the real Big Cheese who was playing the game of... chess. Yes, it's Jim Houseman, a professional villain by the looks of it. Just look at him. His corruption is evident from his horrible little neck beard and tie combo. He tells us that we're the country's dirty little secret and confirm he will be wiping out the whole of Shadow Moses to ensure that there are no witnesses to the events we've just gone through. Suddenly this story is in full conspiratorial swing as we begin our showdown with Liquid. He just wants to fight before the bombs drop and confirms that if Meryl dies, the nuclear device next to her will detonate. Game on. I actually lost this fight due to the timer on my first try, which I'm kind of embarrassed about, but it's a good added challenge to the overall boss fight as without it, I think it would be a bit too easy. Liquid has a couple of attacks, and the most annoying being this running headbutt thing. Another annoying aspect is if you kick him off, this actually just wastes a lot of time. Second time round I got the better of him, and he flies off the top of Metal Gear, but we don't see his body. And you know what that means? He's probably not dead. We then share this beautiful cutscene with Meryl if we didn't give in to Ocelot's torture. And if we did, Meryl is dead, and this story takes a sadder turn. But I'm not going to cover it because, uh, it's just too sad, okay? Otacon and Snake share a nice call where he's going to have to pave the way for us to escape. It's hinted that he might die here due to the bombs dropping, but he's willing to make that sacrifice. Snake and Meryl then exchange some very horny dialogue before they escape to the car park. We then fight off some guards before we break out of the car park itself. We have to break through a few more checkpoints. In the top right here, there's an eight minute timer counting down. This is when the bombs will drop. Fuck me, my heart is racing. This is the culmination of the whole story. Are we gonna make it? Just as we're thinking this, it turns out Liquid is, surprise, still alive, and starts trying to ram us whilst taking multiple bullets to the face like an absolute weapon. We see the light at the end of the tunnel, and then, Are you okay? Yeah, just a little shook up. Meryl, can you move? Uh, uh, it's no good. I can't move. What happened to Liquid? I can't see him either. Liquid's dead. Uh-oh. Snake! If he's dead, that means... Don't say it, Snake. What happened to the air raid? No stealth bombers in sight. Oh. 
Snake, can you hear me? Colonel, are you okay? Colonel, what happened? The Secretary of Defense has been arrested. Early retirement. Arrested? I was able to get into contact with the President. Metal Gear, the training exercise, all of it. It was all the Secretary of Defense acting alone. Acting alone? What happened to the air raid and the nuclear strike? The orders were rescinded. The F-117s and the B-2 Spirits have returned to the base. Once again, I have complete authority over this operation. I see. Washington isn't stupid enough to use nukes to cover up a few secrets. I wonder about that. In any case, the danger's over. Thanks, Snake. Colonel, you can rest easy. Merrill's fine. Really? Thanks. Thank you, Snake. Snake, I'm sorry. I, I kept a lot of things from you. It's okay, Colonel. Snake, I'm not a Colonel. <laughs> oh, that's right. I've got a present for you. There's a snowmobile close to you. Mei Ling saw it on the satellite photos. This time of year, the glaciers are pretty calm. You should be able to ride right out of there. I'll bet the boys at the DIA and the NSA never expect you to come home alive. Me neither. I better not show my face around here. No danger of that. You two officially died after your jeep sank into the ocean. That's not too far from the truth. Also, there's a helicopter waiting for you on Fox Island. Dr. Hal Emmerich should be somewhere on the base. I want someone to bring him in. I understand. Leave it to me. Okay, Roy. Are you gonna be okay? Don't worry. I've got an insurance policy. A hard copy of all Mei Ling's data. As long as I've got that, you, me, and Mei Ling will be fine. The battery on these nanomachines will run out soon. They won't be able to follow us. I guess we won't meet again. Don't worry. I'll pay you a visit sometime. Really? I look forward to that. Roy, just tell me one thing. What? About Fox Die. Meryl will be fine. She wasn't included in its programming. What about me? It killed Liquid. Naomi said that she wants to talk to you face to face about that. How is she? Don't worry. Mei Ling is with her right now. I'm switching over to Naomi. Snake, it's me. Naomi. I heard about my brother. I'm sorry. But he had one last message he wanted to say to you. He told me to tell you to forget about him and to go on with your own life. Frankie said that? Yeah. He also said he'll always love you. Naomi. Your brother just saved you, me, and the whole world. He fought with every ounce of strength in his body. Maybe... Maybe now he's finally found some peace. He wasn't really my brother anymore. Ever since he fought with you in Zanzibar, he's been like a ghost. A ghost looking for a place to die. <laughs> Naomi, Liquid died from Fox Die too. What about me? When am I gonna go? That's up to you. What do you mean? Everybody dies when their time is up. Yeah, so when's mine up? It's up to you how you use the time left to you. Live, Snake. It's all I can say to you. Each person is born with their fate written into their own genetic code. It's unchangeable, immutable. But that's not all there is to life. I finally realized that. I told you before the reason that I was interested in genes and DNA. Because I wanted to know who I was. Where I came from. I thought that if I analyzed my DNA, I could find out who I was, who my parents were, 
And I thought that if I knew that, then I'd know what path I should take in life. But I was wrong. I didn't find anything. I didn't learn anything. Just like with the genome soldiers, you can input all the genetic information, but that doesn't make them into the strongest soldiers. The most we can say about DNA is that it governs a person's potential strengths, potential destiny. You mustn't allow yourself to be chained to fate, to be ruled by your genes. Humans can choose the type of life they want to live. Snake, whether or not you're in the Fox Die program isn't important. The important thing is that you choose life. And then live. Don't you think, Snake? Don't worry. I'm going to choose life too. Until today, I've always looked for a reason to live. But from here on, I'm going to just live. Genes exist to pass down our hopes and dreams for the future through our children. Living is a link to the future. That's how all life works. Loving each other, teaching each other. That's how we can change the world. I finally realized it. The true meaning of life. Thank you, Snake. Look, I found this. Let's keep it as a reminder. Of what? A reminder of a successful mission? Or the first time we met? A reminder of how to live. Huh? Until today, I've lived only for myself. Survival has been the only thing I cared about in my life. That's not just you. That's how everyone is. I only felt truly alive when I was staring death in the face. I don't know. Maybe it's written into my genes. What about now? What do your genes say about your future now? Maybe it's time I live for someone else. Someone else? Yeah. Someone like you. Maybe that's the real way to live. So, where to, Snake? David. My name's David. Okay. So where to, Dave? Hmm. I think it's time we look for a new path in life. A new path? A new purpose. Will we find it? We'll find it. I know we'll find it. What are those? Caribou. For the Aleutians, the caribou is a symbol of life. It'll be spring here soon. For us too. Yeah. Spring brings new life to everything. It's a time for hope. I've lived here a long time. Alaska has never looked more beautiful. The sky, the sea, the caribou, and most of all, you. I think I'm gonna like this new life. Come on, let's enjoy life.
And there we have it, the end of Metal Gear Solid 1. I want to touch on the ending briefly before we finish. The final title card there is brilliant when taken into context of the true ending of MGS5, and shows a common thread running through all the games, but I'll save that topic if I end up covering MGS5. It again bases the story in real life, something Kojima really emphasised towards the end of the game. With Snake, we see this story wrapped up neatly. He's met someone who gives him the power to live for someone else other than himself, and in doing so, goes against the theory that your genes predetermine your fate, unlike his twin brother Liquid who felt the opposite. This is a hopeful ending for us to take away. Who you are is not where you came from, or the genes you were born with, it's your actions and choices that determine who you become. Snake has gone from a cold-hearted killer following orders to someone who is capable of love and thinking for himself. Snake's story in a nutshell is tied neatly by this point, until further games, <laughs> but we're not going to talk about that right now because it makes me sad. Meryl's story, although less prominent, is one of honesty and realisation. She wanted something so bad that it almost got her killed. All her life revolved around this until a crux point, and it took that for her to have that realisation that she didn't want it anymore. Again, for now. We see similar, nicely complete character arcs in those final codec calls with Naomi and Roy. The storytelling is really tight and perfectly done in my opinion from a character perspective. Not only do we care for these characters, but Kojima doesn't rely on killing any of them to make us feel anything, not with this ending anyway. In Metal Gear Solid 1, Kojima has intricately and masterfully woven a narrative never before seen in video games, and one to rival any ever seen in movies in my opinion, dancing delicately over love, war, conspiracy, action, science and history. The gameplay and puzzles for you to solve throughout are a testament to innovation in game design, and marked a turning point in what video games were and could be. Many have tried to imitate this, and will continue to for as long as games will be a thing, but none other than Kojima have successfully replicated it, not to mention the quality of graphics for the time either. And still to this day, the soundtrack stands for me above all. And for that reason, Metal Gear Solid 1 will always be my favourite video game ever. And so, there we have it, the Metal Gear Solid 1 retrospective is finished. Uh, thanks everyone so much for watching. This took me an insane amount of time to write. Um, usually, you know, my Elden Ring boss videos don't take too long and they're quite easy to edit. But this one took, you know, a good month, which explains why I haven't uploaded anything. But um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's been a journey. Um, like I said, it's something I've never done before, but certainly something I've thoroughly enjoyed doing. And if you guys love it and want to see more, please do drop a like. Leave a comment if you have any questions or want to discuss anything I've discussed in the video. And yeah, subscribe if you want to see more. You know the drill. And yeah, look, with Metal Gear Solid, whilst a lot of the story is, as I said, wrapped up in a neat bow, seemingly, we see in following entries that some story threads were just getting started. And I can't wait to go on and cover them in future. Next, for me, I'm going to go live life for a bit like Snake. And with the Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC coming out for Elden Ring, I'll likely do a Let's Play or something. And of course, uh, boss guides for all the bosses. Between then and now, I'm starting a new job, so I'll continue with the base game content for that and maybe some other games like Signalis or Silent Hill if you guys are interested and I get the itch to do another video similar to this. I just want to say another huge thank you to everyone who watched until this point. Love you so much and I really hope you enjoyed watching. This is the Below Average Gamer, aka Bag, aka The Patriots, signing out.